Welcome to the center of the universe and the home of the 18-time Grey Cup champion Toronto Argonauts. This is the X's and Argos podcast with Ben Grant and JB. Welcome to the X's and Argos postgame reaction podcast brought to you by Something in the Water Brewing, the Edmonton Elks. Ed Jout, the Toronto Argonauts, 31-30 in overtime. This is not at all the way we thought this game would go. The result is about right, but man, there were a lot of points scored. This was a far more exciting football game than I think people thought they were tuning in to listen to or to watch. My name is Ben Grant. I'm joined as always by JB, and uh, we'll tell you everything that we saw, what went on in this game, and yeah, the madness down the stretch, records set broken, tied, you name it. It all happened in this game. Before we get into our our recap and our analysis, though, I want to tell you about something in the water brewing. You have a chance to go down to something in the water brewing this coming week as you're getting set to go to BMO Field to see the Argos take on the Red Blacks in the East Division semifinal. Drop by something in the water brewing beforehand. It's the perfect place to go before the game, after the game, you name it. It's located right in Liberty Village, steps from BMO Field. If you haven't yet tried Longboat Pale Ale, the beer that was made for you, fans of the Double Blue, you got to make sure you check it out. This is your opportunity this weekend before you get to BMO Field and see the Argos and Red Blacks play in that playoff game. All right, JB, let's get to it. So initial thoughts. I, I think I advise people to take the under, which is why you should never listen to anything that we forecast. They end up scoring 60, 61 points. Uh, yeah, I was shocked at the offensive display that we got, and I guess I probably shouldn't be. Um, no, I, I thought it was going to be um, like much more entertaining than previous Toronto Edmonton end of season, you know, end of season time killers, just because uh, Edmonton's offense has been so unlocked in the latter half of the season, and and uh, you know they I, they they you know they've been an entertaining team that loses a lot, and uh, you know so I, I wasn't surprised that uh, that there was a lot of scoring, but you know it was yeah it was it was a much more entertaining game than I thought. Um, you know Trey Ford. Yeah, I don't know what the I don't know if you're a general manager what you make of it. He he certainly is a star. Is he a starting quarterback? I I don't know. That's that's a, that's a really tough conversation. I think he is, and I think you like I, I, if if I'm the Hamilton Tiger Cats, I am doing whatever it takes to get him to Hamilton. Uh, he's you know he's from the from the areas from not too far away from there. Um, played at Waterloo, obviously. it's He's an exciting player to watch. And I bring him in with the promise of building the team around him. And that's your project. Like they don't have, because where else is Hamilton going right now? What's their quarterback plan right now? I think that's a good plan. I think that's a plan that the fans would really buy into. He's so exciting to watch. As, you know, someone covering the Argos, I'm not excited about having to watch the Argos game plan for three games a year. Uh, against Trey Ford because he causes problems like he every time Trey Ford plays against the Argonauts there are issues he runs all over the place today he had 81 yards rushing but he also had 325 yards passing and he didn't play in the second quarter that was Jared Daggy's time Uh, so in three quarters of play 16 of 25 for 325 three touchdowns no interceptions and he runs for for 81 and just was a massive headache and it causes Toronto to have to game plan differently. Like they had Kenneth George Jr. spying, which is kind of unusual to have your halfback. He didn't do it the whole game, but on a few plays, he's there spying the quarterback because you can't you can't have that speed mismatch if you set a linebacker on him. So I don't know. I um, I hope I, he, I he stays know. in Edmonton. I think that's that's my hope is that he stays in Edmonton. It, well, if you're Edmonton, I I don't see how you can let him leave. You know, like I, I think that as as you know, McLeod has been fine, but you can't sell McLeod. You you know you can't put McLeod on posters. McLeod is, you know, in the in the twilight of his career. I think I think you have to go all in on Trey Ford, and you have to hire a coach who is all in on Trey Ford. And you know, m- much like much like the Ravens did with Lamar, you can't have a coach who wishes Trey Ford was, you know, uh, Caleros, you know, like 
if you're going to go in on Trey Ford, I think you have to build an offense around him um, that that accesses what he does well and 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 really embrace it. And you know, so like I hope Edmonton keeps him. I hope they hire an OC and a coach and a general manager who who don't feel conflicted about Ford, who feel like he's a star. And uh, I think it's fun for the CFL to have somebody you know like that because you know he's clearly a star, but. You know, sometimes I think sometimes when teams game plan for him, uh, there are aspects of his his game that he has to improve upon. And let's not forget, like I know Edmonton put up 581 yards of offense, which is absurd. Let's not forget this was not Toronto's starting group out there. You no, you did not and, have... and they didn't game. No, and they didn't game plan. No. and he, and Trey Ford has looked this exciting before. Yes, this is like he, this is, you have to take from an Argos perspective, you have to take everything with a grain of salt. I actually think this is a very positive game from an Argos perspective. There are a couple of injury concerns. We'll get into those, but injuries aside to get 30 points without Chad Kelly, without Hideem Carey, without uh, really using any of your receivers. Arbuckle played really well. He was great. That's, this is the best I've seen Arbuckle play in a Toronto uniform, and that includes his first stint with Toronto. This was a, a terrific game against almost all of Edmonton starters. Like Edmonton's out there trying to win this football game, and Arbuckle looked fantastic. He ended up 23 of 32 for 378 yards, two touchdowns, one interception that wasn't his fault. Looked like two receivers got crossed up somehow, ended up in the same space when Kai Gray deflected the football and ended up being picked off. Was that Jackson? No, that was... Who was that that picked off that ball? I think it was, maybe it was Bratton that picked it off. And he shouldn't, Bratton shouldn't have been there. So someone ran a wrong route. So great game from Arbuckle. But yeah, let's, this is an Argos podcast. It's fun talking about Trey Ford. Let's shift it over to the Argonauts though, and maybe go through this. The start that Cameron Dukes had, what happened from there? Were you encouraged, discouraged by what you saw before the injury occurred? Dukes, five of seven for 40 yards, uh, ran twice for 22. What did you make of Cameron Dukes' play? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it reminded me of the beginning of the season. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you looked, you couldn't see anybody open. Pass rush closed in on him. Sometimes he escaped it, sometimes he didn't. Um, yeah, I would have to say that I'm, I'm much more encouraged to me you know, injury aside, I think Arbuckle clearly took the number two quarterback job um, with with his performance tonight. I thought Arbuckle looked, you know, in charge and and uh, and able to run the offense. Um, yeah, I thought Duke looked fine. He looked exactly like he looked at the beginning of the season. I agree with you. And this is what I said last week. I said Arbuckle would be my guy. If something happened to Chad Kelly, Arbuckle would be the guy that I throw in. And I think you see why tonight, because you can run your exact same offense. You can run all of the traditional stuff that Chad Kelly runs. He's not as good as Chad Kelly, but he can sit in the pocket and fire that football around. He makes intelligent reads. We saw Arbuckle make some some really smart throws. That touchdown pass to Deontay McMahon, he didn't have a lot of time. But he saw immediately, hey, no one picked up McMahon. It was a clever little play. He had Deontay lined up on his left side at the last minute. He goes over to the right. And this now shifted, I believe. I don't know what play call Edmonton had on. But I believe that now shifted man responsibility from one backer to the other. And that wasn't communicated. McMahon went out on a swing pattern. Arbuckle was blitzed. He saw immediately no one's with him, got the ball out there in space, and McMahon just had to run to the pylon. But it's it's quick, smart reads like that that Arbuckle was able to make, even when there wasn't something there. A couple of times where they ran all hooks, everybody was draped all over the receiver. Arbuckle knew, I just can't, I can't take a sack here. And so he just threw it at the feet of a receiver who was covered. And that's the smart play in that situation. It's not hanging in there waiting for something to happen and, and getting sacked, which you see from younger quarterbacks. And that's the kind of play that you sometimes do see from Cameron Dukes, as well as he also plays at times. But I think today Arbuckle really separated himself. And I think you feel pretty comfortable in a situation if Arbuckle needed to come in for a short stint that he could, he could hold his ground. Uh, what did you make of the heavy, heavy use of Makai Polk in the first half and then the disappearance of Makai Polk in the second half? They clearly were trying to get him over that thousand yard mark, which they did. But were they going at it too hard? 
six targets, six catches, 122 yards in the first half. He looked exhausted at the end of that one drive where it was just poke, poke, <laughs> poke. Uh, was it too aggressive? No, I, I didn't mind it. I, I mean, I know people could be like, oh, I could have got hurt or whatever. I, I, I like it. I, I think I think the players like it. I think it shows it shows an understanding. We've talked about this in the past. Like, it shows an understanding that, you know, personal accomplishment is important. It's important to celebrate. It's an important part of being an excellent CFL player and, and the team, you know, recognizing that Polk probably really wanted this goal and, um, you know, and, and pushing him toward it. I, I don't have any problem with it at all. I don't, I didn't think, you know, I mean, you know, could he have gotten hurt? Maybe, but uh, I, I didn't have any problem with it. I mean, if you're going to push for a goal, push for a goal. And he's young. Um, I, I liked it. And I liked that he achieved it. Um, you know, I think that uh, he's, <laughs> I feel like he's turned into a superstar this year. Um, and, you know, I think this game only proved it that, you know, I mean, you could, you could spend your life trying to feed some guys, um, enough receptions to get to a thousand and never get there. Um, the, the, you know, the fact that he was able to do it, I think really locks in that he will be, I mean, I think he's the star next year of the team. Yeah, I think like well, he was he was sort of the star of this year of the receiver. Yeah, court. well, yeah, in he, a lot of ways. Like think about the progression. The guy that was like not even really in the picture, where it was Rasheed Bailey and and Coxey and Daniels and the Canadian receivers, and no one really thought about Makai Polk, and then suddenly he gets a couple a couple of receptions that he turns into something, and everyone's like wait a second, there may be something here. And then before you know it, Rasheed Bailey's out the door and pulls the guy. And since then, he's taken over. He ends up, he would finish, I don't have the updated stats in front of me right now, but I, I believe he'll now have the, I know he has the most receiving yards. I think he has the most receptions as well. He would have passed Coxie today and really deserves to be the team leader in receptions and yards. He he was the guy down the stretch. He Look over his last like five or six games. It was almost every game was, either 100 yards or around 100 yards. And the one game where he was under 50, he had a touchdown. So and that was the game against Hamilton. He's been fantastic. Just such a fun player to watch. And the Argos don't have another receiver with his skill set on the roster. And so, um, yeah, big things to come from Akai Polk. Uh, I'm excited about what he can now do in the playoffs. Uh, let's talk about some of those injuries that happened in the first half because the priority in this game above all else was staying healthy. I don't know that the Argos managed that. We're going to have to wait and see uh, what practices are like this week and how much time, if any, Cameron Dukes needs or Demonte Coxey needs. Those were the two guys that I saw go down. Let's talk about Dukes first because I believe that was the first injury. I could be wrong. I think it was Dukes that went down first though. And First, he he dropped back. Oh no, sorry, it was it was an RPO. Uh, he faked the handoff, looked to pass, realized that his guy wasn't there, and so he planted to go and run with it. And after one step, hit the deck. I my immediate thought was Achilles. We've seen so many Achilles injuries; they look exactly like that. You go to plant, and nothing's there, and you see the the player drop. The reason I don't think it can be is that that is such a a incapacitating and highly painful injury that that is it. There's no getting up and running another play. And Dukes got to his feet. He looked to be in a ton of pain, but he got to his feet. He ran another play, but you knew something was wrong. He dropped back, had no aggression in his feet with his footwork, no, um, no traction on the ground as he was, as he was backing up and fired a ball that was well short of its target. And then also took a low hit that wasn't called. There was no flag on that, uh, a player diving at, at Dukes's ankles. So now he needs help off the field. I wasn't even sure. I don't even know if it was the first hit or the second hit that caught, or sorry, the first player, the second hit that, that caused the, the problems for Dukes. But either way, he was in a lot of pain on the sideline. The question is, how bad is it? Uh, he kept, he stayed in uniform. Uh, he had his helmet. Those are usually positive signs. But at this point we have, we have no idea. Um, what did you make of his injury and the decision to to take him out? Well, yeah, I mean, I think you had to take him out for sure. You're not going to risk him not being able to protect himself. But the fact he stayed on the sideline, I think, is pretty big. 
Um, you know, if you have an Achilles or ACL, MCL, um, you definitely are going in to to get checked. You're definitely shutting it down for the day. Um, you know, I, I hopefully it's just um, a strain, you know, and, uh, you know, that you know, you're just looking at soft tissue stuff and um, and and that there was an abundance of caution to to not play him after he tweaked. You know, he tweaked a little. That would be my guess. If he's staying on the sideline, that is probably more a tweak and and that he pulled uh that he pulled something rather than he blew something out. Maybe a calf or or something like that. Yeah. Well, uh, that's that's certainly what me, I mean. I, I pulled my calf for. this morning, which is getting coffee. So <laughs> yes, I know. Not trying it's to not hard. <laughs> yeah, I know it's it is different at uh with our vintage. Uh, the second injury, and this one I think was probably terrifying, was Demonte Coxie. Uh, you in this game, you don't want to see anybody get hurt, um, but there is a difference between a guy that is expected to be a primary contributor and a guy that you're not expecting to see on the field at all. With Demonte Coxie, this was not a player you wanted to see go down, and it looked like such an awkward hit. So he had a dig route, it was coming across the middle, caught the ball. And I don't, I, I'm not blaming Arbuckle here. I think he had enough time, but it was a pretty bang, bang play. He caught the ball, had enough time to make a quick move before being hit, but was hit so awkwardly. And it looked like, I don't remember who the Edmonton defender was on that play, but it looked like uh, he hit Coxey either in the thigh or the knee and his legs went all over the place. Uh, he spun around, hit the ground. And it looked like, like to me, it just looked initially like, uh, what could be uh, a really problematic injury. What I will say, and we don't know anything, we don't have any updates yet, and we're going to have to wait and see probably once practice starts, but what the good news was is right before half, as the as or at half, as the teams are jogging uh, into the tunnel, Coxey was walking without a limp. I didn't see any noticeable limp. The fact that he was walking, he was still in his gear. He hadn't gone immediately to the dressing room. To me, that's a really positive sign. You know, it could have been any range of things from a contact injury, maybe like a, you know, a contact to the kneecap, which can be really painful. Could have been a a mild hyperextension. There's so many things it could have been, but we're going to have to wait and see on on Coxie's status for next week's playoff game. Uh, but we probably won't know until the Argos take the field for practice this week. Yeah, the, I mean, I think the biggest concern will be, is he in the boot tomorrow? Uh, is it a high ankle sprain? I mean, th- those are those are the, the deadliest ones for wide receivers. It just, you know, you can you can kind of go about your life, but you can't play sports because um, you, you can't drive, you can't run. Um, you know, unless you're Patrick Mahomes and somehow magically you can, but for every other human being in the world, uh, a high ankle sprain will shut you down for, you know, at least two weeks. So that was my concern when I saw it, you know, that that's, that's what it looked like. But the fact that he was able to move without limping is, is positive, um, for sure. You know, I think it'll just be a question of, uh, if you look at the practice this week, you know, if he's a DNP, that, that's not great. But if he's limited, then I think we're in good shape. And we'll stay with the offense right now, but moving into the second half. So Polk came out. Uh, we no longer saw Davaris. It was mostly Mittal, Neald, Brissett. And then Jake Herslow, uh, who was in there. Yeah. Jake Herslow is, he, he, when we talked, when we, he first signed, I remember with his signing, um, and just to give you like a peek behind the curtain, listening at home, JB and I will often divide up responsibility if there are multiple signings. Say, you watch this guy, watch this guy, which we'll, we'll sort of share our notes and then we'll eventually both get caught up with it. With Herslow, I remember not seeing anything. I looked at his production at Old Dominion and he didn't really do anything. And then he went to Houston and he didn't really do anything. And then somehow, he got invited to a couple of NFL camps after not really doing anything at the pro day either and ended up in the UFL. And I was like, yeah. what did they see? But clearly they saw something. This guy has something that the measurables just don't show and the stats don't show either. His first play, he's in there for DeMonte Coxey. He just runs a go route. And Kai Gray was Kai Gray is looking at him like, who who is this guy? Like, and Kai Gray didn't even move his feet for a second. He's thinking like, I, I'm going to be all over this guy. 
Herzlow blows past him. It's a perfect throw from Arbuckle, and Herzlow makes a diving catch in the end zone. His first reception is a touchdown bomb down the sideline and a gorgeous catch. Great throw from Arbuckle. Uh, what did you think of what we got from the mysterious Jake Herzlow? Yeah, yeah, I know. He, you know, he just sneaks up on you. He's, a, a, you know, he's a coach's dream. You know, he's clearly, look, he's clearly a work hard, try hard, gym rat guy. Um, you know, if you could check all those boxes, um, kind of guy, you know, like if I coach to say, if I had 50 of you, we'd never lose. Uh, he does not have any measurables that jump out. You do not need 50 of him. Um, but for sure, I, I, you know, he's a guy you love to have on your team. I think he's, he brings energy. He brings, um, he brings a, an intensity that, that you really love having, uh, especially at practice. That's, that's the thing where you love having that you love having, a guy who's kind of who's kind of going to bring that high intensity every drill every rep um, energy who who is able to 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 make catches when when they need to make catches I think I think that's what it boils down to is like he look he they give him that one shot and he scored a touchdown he dropped the pass um, you know he's not a game changer but the way Montreal sometimes use their tight ends to to punish you. Um, when you're focused on everybody else, I think he has a chance, especially uh, with some of the other, you know, stars that, uh, you know, he has a chance to, to catch you by surprise as like the number five receiver, like much like he did. And that he, he's going to give you a, you know, um, a, a, a route and an energy that you just don't expect coming from, from the number five receiver. And Hoagie told a story on our broadcast that I thought was fantastic, and I'll share it with you, that uh, Herzlow left Old Dominion and didn't have a scholarship offer from Houston. He drove uh, from Old Dominion to Houston and basically joined as a walk-on because he just wanted to play. And uh, that's the kind of heart you're talking about, a guy that just wants to play football. And here he is playing professional football. Yeah, I know. I, 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 I mean, you can see it. You can see why a coach loves it. You, you love to have that. You love to have that kind of energy um, on the team, around the team. Yeah, it's it's, and if if they're able to contribute at all, then that's you know that's that's a that's an even greater win. But I, I think his value is is at practice and having somebody who. You know who will kind of challenge the other guys in a sense to to match his intensity at practice. And so going like again, if if there's a situation where like suppose Coxy can't go, and we'll be able to address this a bit better when we do our pregame walkthrough and get you set for this week's uh, this next week's playoff game. But right now, I'm just thinking in my head like if Coxy can't go. I actually wonder about putting Devaris at Coxy's spot. He's played that position before, not in a while. But he is more natural, I think. I've always felt as an outside receiver. He's been not invisible, but he hasn't been as as much a contributor on the field side. Field side receivers usually aren't. I feel like Devaris on the outside with Polk on the inside might be the answer there. Or do you bring Herzlow in on in Coxie's spot? Like how would you address <laughs> that if if Coxie can't play next week? Um I I mean I would lean towards Daniels um playing it. Um uh, but but sometimes it's yeah it's hard to say you never know as a coach sometimes sometimes you can get into trouble moving too many guys trying to fill up a hole and sometimes you're better just to leave everybody where they are and then just try and fill up the hole with a replacement as best you can instead of you know well this guy can do this and this guy can do this you know kind of move everybody down a, a slot um, yeah so it's an interesting question you know uh, if Daniels were into it. Um, and if he felt like maybe that could unlock him, I, I would definitely support that. Uh, the rest of the receivers, it was great to see Tommy Neal get back involved. He had five catches on six targets for 64 yards. Kevin Mittal, four catches on seven targets for 61. How about that play where you just saw a flash of that speed? We haven't had a chance to see it too often yet because he hasn't really been in open space. He ran a drag and that, oh no, sorry, it was a, it was a whip route or a bang route. And ended up drawing um, Morgan in coverage, a linebacker. And Arbuckle did well to get him the ball quickly. And you just saw him pull away and turn on the afterburners. I exactly. love and that, how fast he can move for that size, 230. And he moves like that. 
Exactly. That and that's that's I think where we've talked about. It. I think that's that's who he is. He is, you know, they don't really use tight ends much in the CFL, but like he's a mismatch guy. He's a guy who's gonna be too big for a corner to hit, and he's gonna be too fast for a linebacker to stay with. And I think those are he's a mismatch guy that you scheme up, and I think um, you know, properly schemed, he he is a cheat code. Yeah, that's because he can do a little bit of everything. They had him play tight end uh, for a number of uh, snaps. Yeah, he was like, in the backfield for a snap. More like how Americans use the tight end to kind of be like, you know, too too big for the corner and too fast for the linebacker. And um, we don't Canadian football doesn't really use that receiver the same way. But I think Matal could be used that way. Uh, let's talk about the offensive line. A lot of changes. I've I trademarked the name Canadian Shield for the five Canadian offensive line starters. <laughs> First of all, it's pretty cool to see five Canadian offensive starters. I know Montreal's done that in the past. I can't remember the last time the Argonauts had five Canadian starting uh, linemen. Um, but it shows you the depth that they have. It really cool to see John Bosse, the left tackle, get the start there. He's a, he's a true rookie, was drafted this year, third round pick. Bose, he didn't have a perfect game. He did um, lose his block a couple times, but he's got those absurdly long arms at 36 and a half inches. And you saw him use that. He made use of it a couple of times where he got beat, just got beat with his footwork, but he was able to extend. He's got a seven foot one wingspan. And that's such a helpful tool. I love that they put him at tackle. Teams are so tempted to put Canadians at guard automatically, even when they played tackle in Canadian uh, university. I love that they gave him a shot at tackle to get some tape down, use that year's worth of practice that he's now had. I thought like for as badly as this could have gone for him. And I, I didn't expect it to go well, not because I don't believe in him as a player, but because it was his first time out there. He's at the toughest spot and he's going up against a full Edmonton team. I really thought they were going to give him fits and they didn't. Uh, he looked really good at there. So from the line, I think the most positive takeaway you have is John Bosse might be a player and he might actually even be a tackle or at least a guard who can play tackle if you need to in a pinch. Yeah, I, th- I thought they they have to be happy with, I think, I mean, the, the Argos have to be happy with um, almost every experiment they tried tonight. Um, you know, it was, you know, Edmonton is not necessarily the highest bar in the world, but it was essentially a starting CFL team. And, uh, you know, and they were able to hold their own um, and be competitive and, and lose on a, on a rarely seen designed rouge. The guy that I would not want to be on that flight home was the backup left tackle, George Moore, who was pretty limited in his snaps but cannot be on head coach Ryan Dinwiddie's um, good side at the moment. I think it was his second play. And again, he didn't have a ton of snaps, but on his second play, he got a 15-yard penalty, uh, which knocked off 15 yards from one of Makai Polk's deep catches. And then in overtime, uh, he again was penalized after the whistle, and that backed Toronto up to the 50-yard line, which was ultimately what led to that missed field goal at the end. They were suddenly second and 25 in an overtime situation. You just cannot afford to take these, these after the whistles shoves. Like in both of these plays, it's not like you're, you're called for holding or procedure. Like those aren't good either, but there is nothing worse than uh, coming right off the bench, trying to impress the coaches with your limited snaps and getting two penalties after the whistle like that. It's just inexcusable. No, I mean you. You, especially at that position, you have to, you have to be, you know, you have to kind of take that rage and put it into your run blocking. I mean, if 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 you can get if you can get riled uh, at offensive line, I mean, you're just dead. They'll they'll eat you alive. And a player that I was pretty excited about seeing, and, you know, maybe this is a small sample size. Maybe this is something that he can learn from. And the next time he gets an opportunity, it won't be the same. But yeah, he's an Oregon duck that uh, has a lot of really good film on tape. Um, And a guy that I was really 
quite uh, hopeful for going forward. So hopefully that's not the the end of of George Moore and we get to see him uh, more next season. But um, yeah, not certainly a, a great start to uh, to his time as a uh, as a CFL starter or sorry, as a CFL player. Uh, let's switch to the defensive side of the ball. Um, guys getting mixed up a lot on that defensive line. We saw a lot of snaps for for Hanson, for example. Aramalati wasn't out there a ton. Holly was. Um, he was a difference maker on a bunch of plays. I know the defense, this is not a, one of their highlight real games when you give up 581 yards of offense. But I thought there were some good plays there. It's just missing all of those pieces and having a few guys out of position. They had Mark Milton, usually the boundary halfback. He was playing on the field side. That is a big difference. And Kenneth George Jr. was playing to the boundary side. It looked like guys got their their signals crossed a little bit. But I thought Benji Franklin still produced a big game. And if you were to pick one guy on defense that that played really well and seemed oblivious to the fact they had so many other pieces in there, I thought Benji Franklin looked pretty good. I know he gave it that touchdown to Gina Lewis. But he was in tight coverage, and he had he had guys locked down most of the night. Yeah, I loved I loved his reaction. You so rarely get an honest reaction from the DB. Usually, DBs are a little too cool. Uh, but he was so mad that he got beaten on that back shoulder because his to, coverage was great. To G- yeah, he was all over him, and then you know that back shoulder. He's like, ah, oh, you just see him raging at the. Um, and how frustrating that would be, you know. Um, yeah, you, look, it 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 shows you how how easy or you know how difficult it is to play defense, right? That if you're if you're not fully schemed and if you're missing a couple of players, I mean, you can go from being a good defensive team to a poor defensive team very very quickly. Like it is, um, you know, Edmonton you know, uh, has, uh, you know, a lot of ability to move the ball. And, you know, I thought, uh, you know, I, I thought it just showed how, how impressive it is that the Argos defense is able to, to be better than this because it, uh, it doesn't take much to not be able to play good defense. You know, it, it, it really is so hard to play defense in the CFL. It's, there's just so much space and the rules are so built for the offense. Um, you know, I thought the guys did okay tonight. You know, just Trey Ford, if you don't have a really specific game plan to keep him in check, he will eat you alive. There's just no two ways about it. Uh, were you surprised to see, against the three-man rush, Edmonton leave Ralph Holly one-on-one with the center? <laughs> that was what led to the Trey Ford fumble, where Holly was just one-on-one in the center. Two guards not doing anything, just kind of watching things happen as – Ralph Holly just jams the center, pushes him right back into Trey Ford. The ball's on the ground. Edmonton recovered. But I don't like it's it seems to me, it is amazing to me that teams around the league still aren't oh, preparing we talk, yeah. for yeah, we Ralph Holly. Yeah. hundred percent. It's like, it's like they just it just takes so long for the league to recognize you as good. It, it just it just it doesn't sink in. It just seems to take you know, at least two years of you being able to do it before before the league kind of recognizes you as a name and somebody they have to deal with. Yeah, and yeah, Ralph Holly made them pay on that one. Uh, pretty light in the sack department for the Argos on D. They were only able to register the one sack. Uh, Derek Parrish uh, got home on one. He, he hit... He hit Jared Dagey so hard in the <laughs> spine on that one play. I don't even know what happened. Like he was picked up initially, left tackle picked him up and then let him go. I, like it was like the left tackle thought it was a screen or something. It wasn't. And Parrish freed himself and just ran full speed into into Dagey's spine. So yeah, was- I mean, I didn't. I, I thought the defense played fine. You know, I, I I thought I thought the tackling was fine. It wasn't embarrassing. I thought when the guys had a chance to make a tackle, they did. Um. You know, I just think they were they, they were playing a very a very boring uh, vanilla defense that was was in no way able to stop a guy who could you know run like a track star everywhere. I know I did like the track speed that we saw from Mark Milton and Benji Franklin where Javon Leak was not expecting to be caught from behind when he sprung for that 88-yard run, 
which was the longest run the Argos have given up all season. They also give up the longest pass play they have all season with that uh, 71 yarder to Smith, both happening in the same game, but with a lot of defensive starters out. But Leak is not used to being caught from behind. This guy can move in the open field. Not only did Milton catch him, Franklin was right on his heels. So remember, Franklin has got that 4-2-8 that he ran. Milton's 4-3-8. The, these fast DBs, um, man, it's fun to watch them in, in space. Just this that change of philosophy we've talked about going with speed. Um, you saw the benefit of that. Now, it didn't matter in the end, but it really could have. That was a four-point play. If Leak scores that touchdown, uh, that's an extra four points than they ended up getting. They had to settle for a few little on that drive because Mark Milton was able to track him down. There's something about having that kind of speed in the secondary that you just you just love to see. Yeah, and I mean, if you know, if Ford ends up in Hamilton, I mean, I don't know. Hamilton may keep their uh, Eastern Eastern MVP. Um, but if if he Ford were to end up in Hamilton, I think I, w- I would really be curious to see what they did with that speed and Ford, right? Where you're gonna whether you're going to spy him or you're going to double spy him or you kind of have like a pincer action where you're just concentrating on keeping him from from tearing you apart. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's this is a conversation for this is a, it's not even a conversation for next year. It's a hypothetical conversation for next year, but we will be thinking about that in the offseason. It would be interesting to see where Ford lands. I just I can't imagine Edmonton won't do everything they can to keep him there. But ultimately Ford's going to make a call because he, there's a number of markets that are going to be interested. So he will have his choice and yeah, he should go for the best, the best pitch. Whoever's going to build the team around him. That's got to be where he goes to Uh, special teams. So Lira Maharalahu tied the Argos single season field goal record, 55 field goals, tying Lance Chomick had a shot to break the record in overtime, but Again, we talked about that 15-yard penalty. It backed them up, ended up being a 49-yarder. He missed it just to the left. Um, and ultimately, that was what cost the the Argos the game. I can't put that on Haralahu. Uh, I do put the first one on the mechanics of that field goal. Do you see what happened on that first field goal attempt of the game where they, they missed it? I couldn't see if it was a snap, a hold, just a missed kick. It didn't look like anything was out of sorts from where I saw the ball. No, yeah, but the no, timing was- seemed off, though. Yeah, he, he just didn't hit it clean. I think that's all it was. He just, um, you know, like it, it, it. There was nothing specific that you would point to, with, you know, whether the laces or or his, you know, the snap got down late or like for, you know, from watching it, it just felt like. Um, and even with the other one that he missed, he just wasn't quite. He didn't quite have it tonight. You know, he just he was not hitting it as as clean as he normally does, and you know. The, you're, you're bound to have nights like that. He 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 certainly hasn't had almost any this year. So, you know, I think that's okay. I think he just, you know, and I mean, you know, I, like anybody, you get close to a record, of course, there's, there's going to be a little bit of that in your head. Well, you know, why wouldn't it? This, you know, this is, he's never going to have a chance to, to earn this record again. Um, you know, I can't imagine that didn't have some impact on him. And he also ended up breaking the 200 point barrier. And I, I don't know where that has him now. I think that might be third all time for Argo's points in a season, something like that. I don't know if he ended up third, fourth, fifth, somewhere around there. I think it might've been third, but I'll have to check that out as well. But yeah, still an amazing game for him in terms of the uh, tying, setting records, uh, putting together all time seasons. He has been a great find. It, it's so Funny to think about, like, because Boris Beattie didn't have a good year in Edmonton. Boris Beattie is the all-time club leader in field goal percentage uh, from last season. Uh, Haralahu uh, isn't that. Uh, he didn't have the magical season that Beattie uh, somehow had last year. But he has been fantastic. He's done everything that was asked of him this year. And one of the most maybe maybe um, underappreciated off-season signings was, was Liam Haralahu bringing him in after Beattie signed in Edmonton. Yeah, I mean, look, tremendous, a tremendous move. It could have backfired. BD was um, excellent, uh, you know, kind of an energy guy, part of a of a team vibe, and um, they knew what they were doing. They knew they could replace him with this kind of quiet efficiency and uh, and and not miss a step. And uh, of course, in the other 
uh, game tonight. The Hamilton Tiger Cats lost in the most <laughs> painful fashion. And if you haven't seen this game yet, JB, did you watch the end of this this I, Hamilton I Ottawa did. game? I feel like I feel like there should be a suspension coming because that referee took a shot at the end of the game. I didn't see that. See, I was our broadcast was already underway, so um, I wasn't able to watch it. But I it, it was it was on in a monitor in the corner, and every so often I just looked over and I saw Hamilton had first and goal from the one yeah. for the win. And well, they I, didn't get it in. I look, I thought, I thought, I mean, I thought the first one got in. So I don't know what was going on there. I thought, the, I thought clearly the first attempt got in. And, you know, that was one of those advantages of being at home. Uh, and they said he didn't get in. Now the other two didn't, but then the other one fumbled and, you know, and then it was, <laughs> it was just chaos. Referees flying everywhere, ball flying everywhere on the third attempt. But uh, yeah, that was um, that was quite a game. Uh, I know Argos fans probably enjoyed uh, watching Hamilton come one yard short, even though it was a meaningless game. Imagine if that game had meant something. Um, but I know Argos fans always find uh, find joy in 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 Hamilton and fans just suffering. To show you. You don't want any part of Ottawa at home. They have some uh, mojo going on there that you don't want to mess with. Do you look at it as a good or bad thing, or does it not matter to you that Ottawa got to win tonight? Because they had lost five straight coming into this. I was kind of of the mind that you want Ottawa to lose, having lost six straight coming in, but maybe that's not the way to look at it. No, I don't think so. I, I think the win is fine. I think... Um, you know, I, I, I think you, you bring Ottawa in and they're not like, it's us against the world. Okay. Like they won a game and that streak is over and, you know, they, they had that big comeback against the Argos and people will talk about that. And I think it, it, I think it takes some of the air out of their Nobody believes in us balloon, um, where had they lost this game or had they not made the comeback against Toronto, I think people are Toronto. I think Toronto is probably like a, you know, a touchdown favorite. Um, and I don't think Toronto will be. And uh, I think that that is good because I think Toronto is a touchdown favorite, but I don't need them to be that in real life. Any closing thoughts before we sign off on this one and start prepping for the East <laughs> division semifinal? So thank, thank God they don't play many of these late games. How about that? That was <laughs> I I would I was I I think uh, FanDuel had me at plus fifteen hundred not being awake for this pod. <laughs> the BC um, one was was worse, but yeah. Anytime you're in Alberta, um, yeah, those these yeah. late starts. No, are... look, I, I thought it was a, a very entertaining game, and largely we got out healthy. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited for this for this Ottawa game. I think, um, you know, it. Uh, it it should be a game Toronto wins handily, but um, yeah, I'm 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 really looking forward to it. Saturday, November second, we will have our pregame walkthrough for you this week. Look for it on Wednesday night, and we will bring you everything we can possibly bring you to get you set for this one. And if you have the opportunity to do so, get down to BMO Field. The energy is electric in the playoffs at BMO Field. Ticket sales always go well. And this, no matter what the result, will be the last game the Argos play in BMO this season. So make sure you get down there and stop by something in the water brewing on your way there as well. We'll see if we can make it out uh, pregame uh, for a, a visit too. Uh, the final from Commonwealth Stadium, the Elks 31, the Argonauts 30. That will just about do it for us on this postgame reaction episode of the X's and Argos podcast. For JB, this has been Grant saying so long and may all your pre-snap reads be good ones. I'll see ya.